Okay, so for the afternoon sessions, as you can see, we've put you into some peer groups that might, uh, might just be for today, or who knows, they might last longer than that. Um, everyone should have, if you are uh, the farmer advocate or the facilitator at the table and you don't have this set of questions, then if you wanna raise your hand, we'll make sure that we get you the questions. But what we're gonna do, we're gonna do three different sessions. The session's gonna, each session is gonna start out with one of the farmer advocates coming up here and talking to you. And then when they're done, we're gonna turn it over to the tables where you're gonna have some time to um, answer questions. So the way that we're gonna do that, we're gonna put the questions up on the screen and you'll also have them in front of you. Um, we want to give a few minutes to let people kind of like think about their answers to the questions and then we'll kind of just have a roundtable discussion around that. But we're going to start with Les Seiler. Um, Les Seiler, I have to say that he um, probably was one of the farmers that was instrumental in like getting the Farmer Advocates for Conservation started. He was involved um, with soil health, with talking to other farmers, and was really kind of um, bringing to the attention that we need this kind of, we need more farmers out there telling their story and being able to like share knowledge with each other, to like make those times of like when someone messes up, hey, let me tell you what I did so we can work together. So we're really happy that Les has agreed to both be on the advisory committee for this project and also to be a farmer advocate for conservation. So I'm gonna welcome Les up here, and before he starts talking, we're actually gonna show you a video. Um, we've had David Icke creating these videos for the farmers to kind of like get their pictures and name out there. This was a special video that we did with Les, um, working with Robin Wilson from Ohio State, just kind of like getting into some of those farm values. So hopefully this works, I'm gonna play it for you. My name is Les Seiler. Um, we're in uh, Northwest Ohio, Fulton County. Uh, I farm with my brother Jerry. Uh, we farm corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, alfalfa is part of our diversity that we've incorporated into our crop mix. And we're, we're trying to do that to uh, promote soil health, build soil health. Um, that's a pretty, pretty high priority here, what we're doing and uh, we're a continuous no-till farm and uh, continuous cover crops. We incorporate that on every acre every year. The why for us was uh, because of erosion, soil erosion. Um, we used to farm in, with methods that were causing a lot of soil erosion and, and gullies across the farm and uh, um, wash, washouts all, everywhere. And, and it was just, that was the biggest reason for the why. I mean, it was, I think, 2014 when Toledo decided the algae bloom was too much and they had a lot of people that couldn't drink the water. And I know agriculture does did play a role in that part of that. There was a lot of other factors too, but I guess I, I feel strong that everybody deserves good quality water. Why didn't I, why did I do, why did it take me five years to, to get a cover crop on our system? You know, it's probably just management. And how was I? How was we going to manage it? Manage it. I'd go to meetings all winter and, and just try and understand how was my brother and I going to make cover crops work because I knew that we needed that. But it it was a, a different level of management that we were never used to doing. And we had these nice nice mounds sticking up, you know, good black soil. And then I started seeing all this black soil end up in the ditches from wind erosion. This was an, another thing. And I, I caused that. I made that decision to do that. And I was letting soil that we purchased and paid $5,000 an acre for 
blow into the ditches. And that, and that alone contributed to the, the problems down in Lake Erie. And, and, and that was a dumb, a dumb decision on my part to, to do that. But that's the kind of learning that we did. I mean, made mistakes. We, we made a lot of mistakes along the way, but um, we just keep trying to improve on that. I think at some point, we're all at that point where we don't know whether we should take that step or not. And, and I think that's where the network of reaching out and asking somebody for help, there's nothing wrong with that. Because you're, you're not gonna be able to Google the answer for your situation. It, it, don't, it probably don't exist. I think that sums it up. I mean, my, my feelings on water quality is that I want the water leaving our farms to look clear. I can't tell you that they don't have some nutrients in them, because they probably do. But I hope it's a smaller amount than, I don't want to see soil leaving our farms through the drainage tile. We know that clearer water's better than the, the muddier water going out of it. Um, if, if you got mud leaving, you, you got sediment and you got more nutrients leaving. Um, that's something, maybe you can make a change, inspire you to make a change to, to, to tie that up a little bit. Maybe, maybe a cover crop or maybe something else, a different crop in there, diversity. Okay, you ready, Les? I don't. What do you want to do? Questions and answers? Uh, talk a little bit about what we're, where we're at, what we do. Um, I'm from Fulton County, northwest corner of the state here, right up against the Michigan line. And uh, we started no-tilling. My brother and I farm together, farm about 1,700 acres. We started no-tilling back in 1986 because we had erosion problems that were just horrendous. We didn't have the drainage systems that we have today, which I'm, I'm a big believer in drainage. I'm a, I'm a believer that drainage enhances, subsurface drainage helps enhance soil health too. I mean, I don't know that there's a lot of studies been done on this, but I can guarantee you there's a lot more productivity when you've got more air cycling through that soil profile on a nice day and and it's really a great thing when you're when you're getting these rains nice rains that are you're rewetting the soil and you get you get a, a flush of uh, biological activity and and uh, you can go smell ammonia or something you know that's your that's your good the good stuff that the crop can use I think as as far as uh, cycling nutrients and, and, and that's where this cover crop thing come in too. We know, we know that uh, we've always heard about stratification and we were probably guilty of it too before we started using cover crops. Uh, we'd spread P and K on top because that's just what you needed to do. Didn't really know why we was doing it, but that's what we thought we had to do. And uh, I think we did have stratification but I think we've busted that up pretty good now with uh, cover crops and that living root, keeping something living more than uh, a corn or soybean plant. We try to keep different crops on the land. We, we've been growing barley for malt. That makes an excellent place to double crop beans. Um, that was kind of a nice deal this year. Then we're 30 bushel beans. Um, the fields mowed off. And, and barley's a really cool crop because the lignin in barley straw is different than wheat straw. If wheat straw is a bear to plant corn in in our area because you're always going to deal with probably slugs. Anybody from Ohio in here, I guarantee you know what slugs are. And uh, we found that we struggled to get a corn crop planted in wheat stubble. 
So we, we uh, wrote that off and we've been putting these blends of cover crops and uh, several species mix, seven to 10 different things in the hopes that something in a dry year or wet year is gonna be successful out there. And it usually works that way. You don't know what's gonna be, what your year is gonna shake out to be, but you're gonna have something in a mix is gonna be more successful than just one species out there. And we've, we've leaned on cereal rye really hard, and I worry that in some point we'll, we'll see that as a monoculture too because it's something that we've been leaning quite hard on in our area. And uh, we started doing this, or the cover crop thing, in 2008. So we have a few years at it. And it's not always perfect. We do uh, aerial seeding on our corn sometime around Labor Day. We do a uh, uh, drive-through broadcast situation with the high boy in our soybeans. The tram lines that we have in it with our sprayer match up with, our, with the guy that does the work for us. So getting these covers out there is really not a problem. Having success every year is usually the problem. And there, there's nothing that matches like uh, drilling the crop if you can get your corn and soybeans off, but um, we don't get that done. And uh, this year we harvested our eighth corn crop and we haven't put any phosphorus on at planting or n nothing. I mean, we're trying to, trying to get with the program and cut back on inputs and that's where the use of these um, covers and multi-species and the whole system there that we've been working with works. Malcolm, I wanted you just before you go, would you mind sharing your vision for your farm? Uh, the vision. That's the, the question that they're all going to answer. So. Okay. The vision for our farm is I hope, I hope to see it grow and uh, be sustainable down the road like I said in that video, I want our water leaving the farm clean. I've watched a lot of tile outlets that look like chocolate milk, and that's some sort of soil or nutrients leaving with that. And I, I can tell you that we have a lot of clear, all clear water that I know of leaving the drainage outlet. The, the land is the greatest filter for, for the soil that you could ever imagine. I mean. That, that is powerful, and, and when you get this, this soil aggregated and healthy, you can absorb all that water from a rainfall, and, and your crop's gonna take it up. It's just, we've heard that this morning with everybody talking, and, and that's all true. There, there's, it all happens, and, and it can happen anywhere. I mean, um, tighter soils, heavy clay soils are gonna take longer, you're gonna have a a longer window to make that system functional, but when you start looking at what this biological thing is about, it's, it's bigger than any of us understand. You know, we could come back in 10 years and maybe we'll understand a little more of it, but it's, it's important, it exists, and I wanna see that, I wanna see that uh, continue. Uh, my son, he plans to keep farming with us. Uh, um, He's, he's uh, 29 years old now, and he's already farther ahead. <laughs> I wished I was his age and knew what I knew today, and I'd, I'd almost like to trade places a little bit with him <laughs> because he's a hell of a lot more educated on what soil health is about and things that we're trying to do today. So my vision is to see that move on with him I learn from him every day. <laughs> it, it's uh, it's a pleasure to work with your family. Um, pardon me. It it's kind of cool. I mean, it, it's just a neat a neat situation when you got you got uh, your family working with you. So, what else? Um. I want to, want to see the land progress. I mean, we're learning along the way. I mean, and, and uh, I want to see the young people 
take a hold of this stuff everywhere because I think that's we that's the future of this whole thing. Get involved with these young people like like uh, Stephanie's son here. I mean, he we need that, and they that's that's the cool thing. I love working with these young people on different programs, and and uh, I think that's going to be the success down the road. Um, that it. Okay. I bailed long enough. Okay. Thanks, Les. Okay, so just some, um, I guess, instructions about the peer group conversations. Um, you'll see the questions, if you're at a farmer table, which are mostly all of them, we just have a few resource professional tables in the back, so we have slightly different questions for if you're farmers or if you're resource professionals. Um, if you can't see up here, we also have cards at the table for what they are. But what we're, what we're asking you to do now is take a look at those questions um, maybe use your notebook. We'll give you a few minutes to write them down. Um, some things that you may be thinking about, um, you know, some of these questions might apply to you more than other questions, so just answer the ones that you feel comfortable with. And then um, after we're done having this time, period of time where you're thinking of your answers, we'll have a chance for the tables to share what you're comfortable sharing with. So it's a space where like, you, you do wanna be honest with, you, with yourself, and um, it's, a, it's a chance for you to like, really think through some of these questions, and also to make connections with people at the table who might have experience with that. And then um, I also have Ashley Brucker up here. American Farmland Trust, both Julie and Ashley, have been really um, instrumental in helping organize this um, conference. And last night we did some facilitation skills, so I'm just going to have Ashley add to what I just said. Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so as we look at these questions that are up here, there are no right or wrong answers. Um, only the answer that applies to you. There's also many ways that you can define what these questions are asking. So um, there might be some tables that have spouses where there's a main decision maker and there's a support person. So your visions might be different from each other for your farm. Multi-generational groups that are here dad's vision might be different than son's vision and that is okay we are not asking you to share everything share what you are comfortable with in your group um, we're not looking to solve anybody's problems today or find solutions to anything we're really just looking for you guys to find some commonalities in your group with your farmer advocate so that you can continue to support each other through whatever may come, whether that's challenges with farming, with your, your plan, your long-term plan, with mental health, <clears throat> whatever that may be. So um, just make sure that uh, you're comfortable with whatever you're sharing, that it applies to you and your situation, and you're off to the races. So we'll, we'll start with, uh, let's just give two minutes for you to, um, you know, quietly not talk, either write or think about what you want to say. We'll let you know when that two minutes is over, and then we'll give like a 20-minute a period for discussion. <laughs> 